but if the time when they are back in their classroom is is valuable and rich and real, children will catch up. What is up, everybody? And hello from planet Earth. I'm your host, Philip. Most of you will know me as Phil, and this is the Future Minds Podcast. Simply the best podcast out there, covering all you need to know in edtech, online learning, the digital economy, and what's being done around the world to shape the minds of the future. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Vivian Jones. Vivian is the executive principal at Alcana House and a former English teacher with a passion for education. Having spent the last 30 years in the industry, Vivian has given her all to help develop the minds and lives of her students. In this episode, Vivian and I discuss how COVID impacted her school, why maths and English is so important, why children need responsibility, the South African education system, and a range of other topics. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with Vivian, and I'm sure you will too. Without further ado, I bring you Vivian Jones. Vivian, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for coming on. Um, to start off, maybe just give us a little bit about your background and who you are. Okay, well, as you said, Vivian Jones. I'm currently executive principal at Alcana House, which is an independent school. My education has been my life. For the last 30 odd years, that's what I've been doing. So I have a master's degree in, in education, which I did part-time. And yeah, I, I, I have run a school. <laughs> yeah. And, and how did that career sort of develop for you um, after your master's? You know, where did you go and how did you work your way up to becoming the principal? An absolutely traditional route. So teacher, deputy head, head. Okay. I've been head of two schools, primary school, remedial primary school, and, a, and, and then a high school. Mainstream high school, and um, from there I was promoted into executive head. So okay. 15 years I did in the trenches as a head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I started as an English teacher. English teacher. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And would you say that um, your time spent as a teacher prepared you for the role that you're now? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. I think there's a, a lot of things that prepare you. I think a lot of it has to do with personality. Um, my studies. Um, teaching, I've te I taught overseas as well, which also brought another dimension. So, but no, I don't think, I, don't, I think when you train as a teacher, you're not ready to be a teacher either. So yeah. I, you, le you yeah. learn, you yeah. learn along the way. But yeah, it prepares you up to a point. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the topics to get out the way, everyone's talking about it and has been for the last year is the coronavirus mm. um, and the impact that that's had on the education se sector. Yeah. How has, how has COVID impacted you and your school? Uh, well, it's impacted us from a point of view, not so much the education, I, 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 well, based on our metric results, not so much the education, but the schoolness of school. So all the social, sport, the cultural, all the hidden curriculum, I would say, mm. has that's how it's impacted, even now that we're back at school, because we, we managed to go online quite easily. It's a, it's a, a school that is well-resourced, children have um, their own laptops so mm. you know we we were we managed that it wasn't easy but we managed it so educationally well let's say curriculum wise yeah we got through and our and our and our markers were all there who knows long term what the social impact what the, was. the social yeah. impact is yeah yeah, yeah. because i could imagine well, at least you know i can imagine during a time like that especially sort of in that transitioning phase you know from um, from primary school into high school, mm. you know, those first couple of mm. years uh, is sort of socially difficult for a mm. lot of students. And one of the things that's become more and more of a topic of conversation the last couple of years has been mental health. Mm. Um, and, you know, how, does, how do you think about mental health at school? Because 10, 15 years ago, this wasn't really something that yeah. teachers or educators had to yeah. consider. It there's two things, well, our, our school, apart from the, the academics, fundamental to our school is, is what we call our tutor system. And and that is basically to look after the children. And I think for parents, it's wonderful because they worry about the teenage years. So the way it works for us, and I'll, I'll answer your, I have to give mm -hmm. you some context before sure, I say sure. how this helped in COVID, is every teacher in the school has a tutor group. And that tutor group isn't a full class, it's usually about 15 children. 
and they look after them from when they come in. We, we start in grade seven, from when they come in right until they leave in matric. So relationally, they become very strong. They learn about the child. They can see changes in behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So we look after our children anyway, pre-COVID. That is very much fundamental. A happy child, a well-adjusted child will learn. Yes. So it is very core to who we are. It's, it literally it runs as strong as our, as our education in our school. So come COVID, those tutors, although they couldn't um, physically be with their kids, they checked in with them every day, you know, and they know them well enough. The relationship is very, very important. Yes. So I think, yeah, I, I mean, it's paramount to what we do. Yeah, I, I don't think, you, you know, to, to try and do education in a vacuum, all you're yeah. going to get is, you know, knowledge in, knowledge out. Yeah. You know, so you know, along with that, another thing that's changed over the last sort of decade or two is this idea that the traditional education system, that sort of sage on the stage, mm. Edwardian mm. Um, education model, is outdated. Mm. And with the rise of technology, we sort of, we we have to shift or we have to mm. adjust. Uh, and now, you know, you mentioned that um, Alcana House is well equipped um, technologically. Mm. So, what have you done to? Uh, sort of embrace that digital revolution and pivot from the traditional model to a, sort of a hybrid learning system where yeah. kids are incentivized and encouraged to make use of laptops and iPads and things of that nature. Yeah, look, I mean, when you say, what have we done? <laughs> it, it, to me, it doesn't feel particularly revolutionary because... Just kept up with it. We just times. kept up with it, yeah. So yeah. every single child from grade four has either an iPad or a laptop. They only get their laptops in grade um, nine. So we're all on the same platform, which mm. does help. Um, we've got a strong infrastructure in the school. And teachers have just started changing. It's a difficult one because we've got curriculum, which is stuck, yes. <laughs> you know, where it is. But now presenting it differently, um, children handing in their assignments, doing their assignments differently, thinking, you know, do, do I have to just, you know, write this down you know, are there, is there other ways to, to, mm. to do assessment? So all of that. We're also quite a creative school. So, you know, a lot, our, our design departments, you know, at the moment we're, we're making a, um, a whole designed space that's going to have, you know, all the tools, you know, 3D printer and laser cutters and all of yes. that at green screen. But it's going to be more than that. And we're going to incentivize the children. They'll get points for... Um, almost gamifying it, you yes, know, yes. so they'll get points if they can come up with ways to to use this equipment and, and, and sort of forego all the traditional stuff. So it's all still very experimental to us. And you've got to remember, it's an interesting one because schools are run by old people like me. So it's completely out of our, yes. our, our depth. So, I mean, our school is embracing it. Yes. Um, and we're trying to use it best we can. But we're often led by the children. That's, you know, they'll come up with an idea. Yeah. They'll come up with yeah. an idea and say, well, why can't we do it like this? Yeah. And luckily, our teachers are in that space that they go, okay, yeah. yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be traditional. So I don't think it's always led by the teachers. We enable the teachers by making sure we've got all the resources. And that is obviously, you know, not every school has that. Yeah. But yeah. it's often led by the children. So, you no, know, which is exciting. Yeah, that is. Yeah. That's incredible. I yeah. Think, yeah. So sh giving, giving children that uh, level of respect and mm. equality, responsibility. Yeah. You know, that they can come forward with ideas and be heard yeah. is, is quite unique. Yeah. And at the prep school level, although they don't have, um, they do, we don't encourage technology for the, for the very little ones, but we are doing design thinking. So, you know, the, all the old fashioned building blocks, basically, old fashioned mm -hmm. building blocks, problem solving, and, you know, sort of big problem solving toys, that kind of, so you get the design thinking going. And obviously yes. that will eventually lead into the, you know, the coding and the creativity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So have you introduced coding at your school? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is something that I wish I had at school, but um, you know, even ten years ago, mm. this was pretty pretty unique. Yeah. Uh, you really didn't find it in school, so it's yeah. nice to see schools embracing it and and you know integrating it into their curriculum. Yeah. So coming to uh, one one more thing, you know, if we look back, um, something that's again been a topic of conversation many years or the last couple of years has been the way that students learn. You mm. know, I know that there are some people on, you know, for and against mm. the idea that different students learn in different mm. ways mm. and therefore they need to be catered for mm. in their specific individual unique learning style. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I'm, I feel very strongly about it. Having, having um, been head of a remedial school, I, I, I could see daily children learn differently. Mm. Um, 
it's marrying the two. In a mainstream school, it's marrying the two because we are stuck in the system, whether we like it or not, and yeah. most of us don't like it. There's a, you know, there's your curriculum, there's your exams. Our universities want those exams, you know, so you, you are stuck in that system. Yes. But within that, you've got children who all they all learn differently, but they also have different interests. Mm. And I think what's happened to our education system, apart from the fact that the curriculum is restrictive, we've lost those schools that cater for different children. We've lost the art schools. We've lost the technical schools. We've lost, you know, so sometimes it's not even about learning differently. It's saying, well, I can learn in this way if I'm interested. Yes. And I think that is where we are severely lacking in this country, yes. is different types of school. Yes. Everybody wants to fi fix the system, but however you fix it, it's still going to be one system. And one That's system really is never point. going to suit everybody. Yeah. What we need is a few different systems. That's a really good point. I've never thought of it that way. And you're right, because, you know, you have, you have different interests. Mm. And, you know, one of the ways that I thought about education, because you, you only realize how sort of drone-like mm. you operate as a young, you know, child, student, mm. whether it's at varsity or school, um, well after you've left and you reflect mm. on the time at school where, you know, information that was given to you, you simply took it at face value. Yeah. You know, many times that sort of deeper uh, thinking or, or thinking mm. from first principles wasn't encouraged or even, even spoken about. But reflecting back on it, you know, I think that one of the definitions of a successful education is to leave uh, high school um, with a deep passion or interest mm in a specific subject yeah. and then having all the foundational sort of tools at yeah. your disposal uh, from a high quality education, you know, in order to pursue whatever that passion is. Because yeah. with the internet today, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, but, you know, if you're passionate and deeply interested mm. and curious about something, mm -hmm. you can take that education mm. further. And that may be a traditional tertiary institution or it may be something yeah. online. Um, but from a tertiary standpoint, we don't have... Uh, variety. No. And, and the, I mean, a lot of um, stories put on the curriculum, I mean, it's old fashioned, it was industrial sure. revolution. Uh, 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 uh. But like you say, you can get that information anyway. So whether, whether uh, so say geography is in and people go, well, why should we do geography? It doesn't matter that it's geography. What matters is exposure, that you can research it, that you can critically think about it. Yes. That's actually where the value lies. It doesn't yes. matter always what the subject is. Yes. It's a matter of what you do with that subject because you will do, I did subjects at university that I'd never done at school. Yes. It didn't matter that I hadn't yes. done them at school. What mattered is I had the ability to engage with them. Mm. And that is what is important. So I, for me, it's variety and it's all of those skills that they need. Yeah. Content. Yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah. And, you know, although, although some may argue that a subject like geography is, uh, is, is a necessary mm. in, the, in the curriculum, I think what geography does is there's a specific subset of students in the class yeah. that really enjoy yeah. it. You know, and it sparks that interest yeah. in a in a field which they otherwise wouldn't have been. But interested every in. single person in this world could uh, could justify their subject. Yeah, sure. So why these subjects? Sure. You know, and sure. and I mean they're there for a reason. Yeah. You know, and I do think there should be other subjects as well. But as I say, if everybody fought for their subject, we'd have you know three hundred on the curriculum. Yeah. But uh, it, it, it's how you engage with them. Okay. That's, yeah, that for that's me true. is critical. So as a former English uh, teacher, where does uh, sort of English reading comprehension language come in, uh, you know, in that, in that, in that education mm. process? Um, why is it important to have a really solid language background? I mean, it's obvious yeah. the answer, um, you know, to many. But I think if you could take it a level deeper, uh, maybe giving some insights from your personal experience. Well, I think the main thing with English is, well, there's two main things. And one has become more critical, I think, recently. Mm -hmm. The first one is communication. It is about communication, and that's yeah. words, and how you use words, um, tone of words, all of those things. So you study all of that through English. That, and, and in this day and age, I mean, communication especially, as so much is done through the written word, yes. whether it's text or emails or what, a lot more than before, um, without facial context, yes. you have to know what you're doing with words. So I think, I think that's become very, very important. And I think also with, with English, you learn about analysis. You mm. analyze texts constantly. And we're living in a world of fake news. Yeah. So, you know, what do you do with that? You've yeah. got to teach children yeah. 
how how to deal with all of that. Yeah. So uh, in actual fact, I think English, beca- English has become more important than it was when I studied or even when I taught it. Yeah. In that when I taught it, it was like, yeah, you know, you learn to write an essay and, you know, look how lovely this book is. Yeah. Whereas I think nowadays it's actually even more important. Yeah. No, language I, I and communication. Couldn't agree with you more. And I think, you know, if you look at the two primary subjects, you've got maths and mm. English, you know, and the one is sort of grounded in logic and, mm. you know, develops that logical thinking framework where, mm. you know, with English, as you say, communication is important, but being able to critically mm. think and include and exclude uh, relevant and mm. irrelevant information is super valuable mm. and super important today. It is. So parents during this time, the last mm. year, I can imagine, you know, keeping parents happy during during this COVID time has been quite a challenge. It's been easier. Um, <laughs> it's been so much easier. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. They, the, the, I think the parents, look, we did online school well. Mm-hmm. Um, children basically had a time, they had their timetable. We didn't deviate from the timetable. So parents okay. were seeing their children sit down Doing the work. Doing the school day. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a lot of engagement from teachers. Look, it was harder for the littlies um, because they can't be on all day. Yes. But certainly sort of from grade four upwards, parents could actually see what their children were doing, yes. see what they were paying for. Yes. So, and their children were engaged. Yes. So in some ways, it was a little bit easier. We didn't have that parental pushback that we yes. often have. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things but that... But we had anxiety. There was anxi- a of lot course. of anxiety, of but course. not that, not the pushback. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And, you know, I mean, this last year, I think that parents um, in, in lesser resource schools mm. may have started to question whether or not school is worthwhile given the rise of so many online yeah. education programs. Now, you know, I think that online education has its place, um, but, you know, nothing replaces mm. an educator mm. or, or sort of a passionate, well-resourced mm. and well-educated educator. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have uh, that across the spectrum mm. in the country. What do you think um, the future looks like for South Africa, specifically in that sort of subset of schools that don't necessarily have the right resources? How do we include them uh, going forward? Because, you know, with COVID, if you look at the loss of learning that's mm. taken place in the last year, um, that's disproportionately impacted mm. the underprivileged schools. Yeah. Um, and, and it's it t- highlighted it hugely. It has. Yeah. It has. Um, so, I mean, is, is, there, is there an immediate remedy in your mind or is this sort of a longer-term problem that we're going to have to solve step by step? I th- look, I think it is longer-term and, and they need to throw money at it. Money, throwing money at it is not going to change it. There are underprivileged schools that have done exceptionally well because they have good leadership and dedicated teachers. Okay. So as far as I can see, it starts with the adults. Because if the adults in the room are behaving like adults, are giving their all, are committed, and are leading well, that will, you know, you can, you can educate a child under a tree. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it is, no, it's not ideal, but you can do it. But uh, I, think, I think there's something fundamentally lacking in, in leadership of schools and training of teachers. Yeah. That's where it starts. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, training... training. I mean, for years we educated children without computers. Computers aren't... The computers are a tool. They're not a a cure. Yeah. They're a tool. They enable things. Yeah. But for years we educated children without them. Yeah. So, you know, being under-resourced in the time of COVID, yeah, it it, Mm. it does. But if the time when they are back in their classroom is, is valuable and rich and real, children will catch up. Yes. But unfortunately, a lot of the schools aren't well staffed and aren't yes. well led because of training. Do you think it's important to give uh, teachers sort of independence um, and the freedom to to educate their students in the way that they see fit? Or do you think there's sort of more of a balance where teachers have to sort of stay in line with the curriculum, stay in line with the school's philosophy uh, and sort of rein in some of that independence. I think no. I think there needs to be independence, but not complete independence. I think you know. I think there needs to be collaboration. You know, this is what we're teaching. This is you know what the outcomes are, et cetera, et cetera. How you get to that outcome based on who your personality, your strengths, and the children you've got in front of you. Yeah. That is what is important. So I think everybody needs to go into the classroom knowing what what the end goal is. Yes. How you get there. 
a, a good teacher should be able to evaluate how you teach one class may be one that lesson may be different to how you teach ex yes. exactly the same content in another class yes because of who you've got in front of you and that's what i mean by well trained teachers a teacher should be able to do that mm. and yeah that makes total mm. sense so i've got this question that i've actually never asked a guest before okay. um and that sort of it comes to that nature versus nurture debate mm. Uh, when you've got a kid that's sort of an academic star or social mm. star at school or a sports star, mm. um, you know, inevitably a combination um, of that uh, sort of a combination of those traits uh, that that ends up being the the head boy or the head girl of the mm. school for whatever reason. Um, you know, you've got to have the sort of social skills, you've got to have the academic mm. uh, competency or, or achievements in in some other way, potentially some sporting um, accolades. What makes for a good uh, prefect or, or head boy or head girl at a school? Um, is that, uh, and how much of that lies with the student themselves, um, the, the home environment, um, and then sort of the, the, the approach taken at school or the, or the way that they've been educated? I know it's a difficult question, um, but you know, what yeah. separates the head boy from you know, somebody else that, that's, that's, that's lacking? Uh, for, for lack of a better term? Um, I would say it's not always academic. It's not always being the best at. It's, it's, it's leadership, what shines through. Yeah. Um, which, you know, at the risk of sounding like Simon Cowell, is a bit of an X factor. Sure. You know, and it's being able to identify that. So, you know, you don't have to have come from a privileged home and be, well, not, well I'm talking our school, I don't know about other schools, sure. and be the best at absolutely everything or be the top student even. It's mm. a matter of leadership schools. I know when we do prefect selection, we also select a team. Yes. So we don't have a whole team full of A-type personalities. Sure. We sometimes have children who are quiet, but are like their workhorses. You know mm. they're going to be the backbone of this team. So I, I think that also depends on the school and what you're... Yeah. And what you use your prefects for. We don't use our prefects for discipline and lining up and everything. We, we give them a portfolio. And they the run, responsibilities. Yeah, they run those responsibilities. and They run the student body. Okay. They don't control them. They yes. don't discipline them at all, ever. Yes. I mean, they would never tell you to tuck a shirt in or sure. do up your tie. That just is not done. Yes. So it is about leadership, and it's about being part of the community. Yeah, being mm. part of a team. I guess, uh, so that leads me into the question, you know, where there's always a sort of a gray line between where a parent's responsibility start and stop or where that stops and the teacher's responsibility mm. picks up, specifically as it relates to education, but you could argue discipline mm. as well in mm. a way. Um, so how much of a role or how, how much responsibility lies with the teacher in the end of the day when it comes to um, not just educating a student, but you know, helping that student grow up to be a young, responsible adult? Well, I think... I, I, look, I, you can't separate, you shouldn't separate the two. And regardless of what goes ho on at home, a, pair, a teacher should still take on that responsibility. Yes. So you're either working together with the parent or you're supplementing for the parent. Yes. So, I, I mean, I do think there's a responsibility. It, it, uh, that's what I said to you earlier, almost about the tutor group. It's about the whole child. You can't just have that child as a learner in your class. Yes. It doesn't, it's too one dimensional. That child is not one dimensional. So yes, you, you, you have to be responsible for their, their manners, their upbringing, their discipline, their emotional welfare. And hopefully you're working in partnership with the, with the parents, but not always. Sometimes you can't walk away from it. You can't say as a teacher, well, it's not happening at home, so I'm not going to bother. Yeah. All That's right. my sense. I, 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 you, I, you can't look at the child as just a learner. You won't get the best out of them. You can, but yes. you won't get the best out of yes. them. Yes, that makes total sense. So in South Africa, we've obviously got um, we've we've got a we've got an infrastructure problem uh, when it comes to the internet, when it mm. comes to access to high quality education mm. tools. Um, but you know, hopefully, going forward, technology and competition drives down the cost of these tools mm. to a degree. Uh, what, in your mind, does the next sort of five to ten years look like? Um, you know, sort of a shorter question would be five years from now. Mm. Um, what's the one thing that you see having changed the most in the way that we educate at schools? I, I don't know if I've got an answer to that. Because you're saying in schools, I'm, I'm sitting in an independent school, so I could tell you we're going to do this, this, yes, this, and yes, this, yes. which bears no relation to 80% of the country. 
Yes. So uh, that's a, that is a question I, I, do, I, ca- I can't. I can't answer. I totally understand that. And uh, well, I, would, I know where I'd like to see it, but you know. So where, where would you like to? Well, see I it? would like to see. I would like to see all our schools in the country resourced properly. That's not even well resourced. Yes. Resourced properly. You know, do we have toilets? Do we each have desks and chairs and you know a, a, a qualified teacher at the front and 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 learning materials? Even if a computer isn't even in the room, I mean, we'd love that. Yeah. But have we got the basics? And we haven't got the basics yet yeah. in all our schools. We've got them in a lot of schools, but we haven't got them in all the schools. So yeah. for me, that is, it's so much more fundamental than just technology. Yeah. You know, in our school, yes, we'll have, you know, you know, we'll have advanced hugely in five years' time. If I think where we were five years ago, you know, nobody had laptops. Yes. Now we've all got them. Um yeah, so uh, we need to get those. We need the basics. Yeah. The basics are missing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think, unfortunately, socioeconomic issues in mm. this country um, sort of prohibit us from actually having those things because you, you can't have nice things without them disappearing. Yeah. Um, in some places. Yeah. Which is really unfortunate. Speaking about the curriculum, w- what would you, in sort of, in the ideal world, see change? With regards to the current curriculum? I think there should be... Uh, there should be an addition of... I think there should be more choice. I think there should be more choice. And things like... Uh, f- to develop skills, things like psychology and philosophy, just for their, you know, thinking skills. Yes. Things like financial management. Um, there should be some more practical life skills in there. Yes. I would like things not to be assessed as much regardless of which curriculum you have in yes so i don't like i said to you earlier i think you know you could i could argue 300 subjects and why children should be doing this that and the other i don't know the answer to what the curriculum should be yeah what i know is how education is given and how you develop the child is what it will stand in instead yeah and you make a good point about the way that it's assessed because mm. in the end of the day, a percentage point isn't uh, necessarily a reflection of a no. child's ability. No. But unfortunately, it's what it's where we're sending them. We're sending them off to colleges and universities that require that. So you, yeah. on the one hand, you have to get that child ready for that, whether you buy yeah. into it or not. Yeah. You know, philosophically, you have yeah. to get them ready for that. But you also have to know that you've got them ready for the wider yeah. world as well. Yeah, I guess at scale, that's the only sort of processable metric mm. that universities can use mm. to, to, to allow kids in and out yeah. of the institutions, which is difficult. I mean, I look at Australia, for example, where you have the choice to enter sort of a trade school mm. or continue on with your normal education mm. and you can leave at an earlier age. And um, I personally know um, friends that have gone both routes mm. and been extremely successful yeah. as a result, you know, um, one deciding to go and enter a trade uh, from the age of, I think it was 15 or 16, uh, apprentice under somebody, uh, started earning an income, and by the time he was 20, 21, was fully mm. uh, financially and uh, personally independent. Yeah. Um, that suited their personality Absolutely, type. Absolutely, yeah. We don't necessarily have um, have that choice in this yeah. country. Mm. You know, and, and I would argue that, um, you know, that a country like ours, still developing, needs more people that are skilled in sort of a variety of trades. Absolutely. And we used to have those trade schools. I have no mm. idea where they went to. Yeah. Just woke up one day, they were gone. Yeah. You know, and they are vital, vital. And for a lot of children, could make school more pleasant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, because, yeah. you know, they're not getting those facts in their heads and they're really not interested. Yeah. You know, so their value as a human being <laughs> is going to be yeah. higher. Yeah. You know, so I, 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 yeah, there, there has to be more variety. Yeah. We've, we've somehow gone down to one system. Yes. Yeah, it is sad because I would argue that there's definitely a large percentage of students that would benefit and be far more prepared for mm. life had they had the ability to, instead of incurring student debt or paying mm. large tuition fees at a tertiary institution that's very academically mm. focused gone and apprenticed under somebody yeah you know in an industry that they're interested in you know earned a small salary at least they're not going into debt yeah they're learning skills they're connecting with people in the real world mm. they're developing the types of social skills that they may need um and and we just don't have that choice no, anymore we don't yeah 
And that's, I think that's where a lot of people are falling into a pit. Yeah. Because, you know, you leave school and you go, okay, don't really want to go to university, can't go to university, now what? Yeah. Do you have kids? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. I was going to ask what, you know, sort of how you would educate your kids. Um, but, I mean, let's, let's You know, let's okay, so I'll tell question. you, I've got two nephews okay. who I meddle with all the time. Okay. And uh, one had learning disabilities, so he was actually at my school when yes. I was at a reader. So I've been very involved in the education. And they've, they've, they have taken two very different routes. And their okay. parents have educated them at different schools oh. because they're different children. Yeah, that's Not just because of the learning disability, but because of the interests and mm. the type of children they are. You know, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that well, me in the ear, yes. you know, and that's another thing. Parents go, okay, we'll send our children and they both go to the, you know, the same school. And although we're in the same system, if I just think in our area where, where our school is, there's a few different schools. We're all doing the same thing, but we have a very different personality yes. at the schools. And, and our school will, won't suit everybody. Yes. But the school down the road might. And likewise, yes. you know, so I, I also think this notion that we must all go to the same school, or all your, you know, all three of you, your, your parents' children must all go to the same why? It's, a really, it's a really good point. I think there's also yeah. puts a whole bunch of external and unnecessary yeah. pressures on one student yeah. or the other yeah. to compete or compare. Or, yeah. Um, that's, so, that's, yeah, if I had children, I would send them to where I felt was they were best suited and yeah. would get the best out of them. How do you feel about homeschooling? I think there's a place for it. It's been very interesting, us having gone online. I mm. think a lot of... We had a, people leave at the, uh, once we went back... Um, to school, we had parents say, oh, no, online, my child enjoyed it, we're going to stay. That lasted all of, you know, a month, and they were all back. Um, I think it, it, is, it has a place, and it is very, um, for some children who just do not get school, yeah. you know, it, school is excruciating for some children. There's a place for it. But I think what, what happened for us is a lot of parents didn't realize that how much that relational side of, of teacher-student plays into the learning. And when they went on an online school and all of a sudden there's no relational side, it's, you know, yeah. a tutor you don't really know, it didn't work. So it depends, once again, on the child. There's a place for homeschooling. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I cannot buy into any one system <laughs> yeah. because I, I, yeah. because there's too many different children. So, yeah, homeschooling, it's, it, it's a place for it. Yeah. I Does mean, it suit everybody? Of course. No. Of course. Mm. I think a lot of parents, as you say, may have, have considered it as mm. a result of COVID. Mm. Um, and uh, homeschooling is a topic of, or it's been mm. a topic of conversation in this country for the last year and a bit. Yeah. Unfortunately, the burden on parents is quite, uh, yes. is quite intense. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if you have to work a full-time yeah. job. Yeah, and it also depends on the age group of the child. You yeah. know, some children get on with it yeah. better than others. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, tertiary education, how, mm. how do you best prepare students to leave high school sort of semi-knowing what they want to do? Because uh, I find that was mm. with me at least and many of my peers, we sort of left high school doing what either our teachers or parents mm. told us we should be doing um, without any real sort of organic um, and authentic input, mm. you know, coming from who we are and what we were interested yeah. in. Um, do you play an active role in helping students up to a point? That? I think it's become more and more it's become more and more difficult for schools to do that as the world has become wider. I mean, mm. you know, you used to become a teacher, a doctor, you know, whatever. Whereas now there's jobs, you know, I don't even know what half of them are. Yeah. You know, there's there's so many more things that people can do. So I think it's really I mean, we'll give guidance, we'll do career fairs, you know, we'll have days where they go and do work experience, et cetera, et cetera. But it is more to do with it's, I think it's a more parental thing at saying, what are you interested in? Yes. And investigating what kind of things can I do with this interest or this skill or these marks? You know, and I, 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 there's so much that the children can do that we can guide them. Yes. And we can, you know, but we, it, it's hard. It's become harder because there's so much. Yeah. Well, I can imagine. So much that they could be doing now. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, we, you know, we do. Obviously, we play an active role, but... Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with home as well. Yeah, but I guess if you prepare students well enough throughout high school, um, 
you could reliably get to a point where you feel that you can leave that responsibility mm. in the hands of the students mm. and yeah. you know from there they're young adults yeah look i mean they're 18 mm. most of them know what they're interested in what yeah. they absolutely do not want to do i mean that's yeah. that's a, that's a good big thing yeah like i absolutely do not want to do this that and the other and i don't want sure. to study this that and the other so you know by process of elimination most of them are, are pretty clear yeah and it's also you know what is also important is ge- is preparing them in such a way that they become courageous enough that if they make the wrong decision yeah they'll change it yeah that, that's a really good point yeah you know because a lot of students uh, sort of stick through with yeah. a bad decision even yeah. though they don't enjoy it yeah so you know that for me is more of a preparation yeah S- letting them understand that you know even in 10 years time yeah you want to change your career you change your career yeah and if you, you fail you yeah. can you can yeah. get back up and you can yeah. change so i think that is probably more important as well yeah yeah all right and um i guess to sort of bring things to a close there's a couple of questions i like to ask guests and the first one is are there any books that you uh, highly recommend books that have influenced your life um, either for parents um, or for students okay now you're asking an english teacher so i'm i mean i you talking you're talking academic <laughs> books <laughs> um, whether they're academic whether they are, are novels um, any, anything that you anything that have had an impact in your life i mean i'm sure that many books have had significant yeah. impact um, but is there anything that comes to mind If if you're talking um uh, uh an academic book I suppose for me and I suppose that's what my whole philosophy has been this whole talk is mm. is a book called A Mind of Their Own okay by Mel Levine American writer who talks about children as individuals and educating children with a mind of their own yes it's different to that mind you know you're sitting around a whole table every mind will be different yes. not only how it learns but what it's interested in how it processes so I suppose for me that was a, a reading that was an aha moment you know being in a in a school where you've got 30 children sitting in front of you and you yes. know you're doing one you know dimensional so a mind of their own yeah a mind of their own i would say okay yeah. and um non academic a novel um a a psychology book um a no, no no for me um my my, my favorite novel is um a side house rules a uh, side house rules <laughs> yes. i i my John girl, Irving. my girlfriend's actually reading that oh really moment. it's uh, one of my favorites yeah okay wonderful characters great Great. For no reason other than just wonderful quirky characters okay. who make their way in the world. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Vivian, thank you so much for coming Pleasure. on. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Um and we hope to catch up soon. Thank you. Great. The Future Minds podcast is brought to you by Smartic. Smartic is an award-winning, intelligent online mathematics and coding program for kids aged 4 to 14. Powered by sophisticated adaptive AI, Smartic teaches kids math and coding from the comfort of home in as little as 15 minutes per day. For more information, visit smartic.com or download the app on tablet or iPad today.